In this episode, we will get up close, on top, and under the Arthur V. Orman Lock and Dam in Moralton, Arkansas. So buckle up. For, I think, one of the first times ever, we are early because um, Jay told us to be here at 945 and it's 936. And for the record, I think we got here at 934. (laughs) <laughs> or that's good for us. So we are early. Because um, the tour is very exact from a certain yeah, time. He said to be here at 9.45. The tour starts at 10 and it will end at 11. And I've been, we have camped near the Toad Suck Lock and Dam. And we've always watched the barges go through and, you know, the water spilling over at the dam and all of that. And we've been to the Murray Lock and Dam. Um, that the big damn bridge goes over in Little Rock, but we've never had the inside tour and Jay is also going to inform us of the importance of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the work that they do here in Arkansas. So this should be really good. My name is Jay Townsend. I'm the Chief of Public Affairs for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Little Rock District. And this is Lieutenant Colonel C.T. Warren. He's the Deputy Commander for the Little Rock District. We manage the Arkansas River. It's 308 miles through the state of Arkansas, and there are 13 locks and dams on it. And today we're gonna give you a tour of Ormond Lock and Dam. 308 miles of river in Arkansas, but the navigation channel goes 445 miles inland, and it ends at the Port of Catoosa in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with 18 total locks and dams. And so you go from the Mississippi River, just shy of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and that's moving our nation's commerce up and down this river system. We have 12 states as far north as Montana that bring their goods and commodities to the Port of Catoosa in Oklahoma and ship it down this river system and then around the world. So we actually have 445 miles of global coastline right here through the state of Arkansas and Oklahoma. And what you're looking at is the Arthur V. Ormond Lock and Dam. And right in front of you is the lock. This is a lock chamber. To my right is the downstream side, and then to my left is the upstream side. What you're looking at is the empty lock chamber, but then you've also got uh, gates on both ends. These are called miter gates. And so if you went to Lowe's and you purchased a miter saw so that you could cut your edges for the trim in your house or anything else, it's the same type of edge. It's a mitered edge. And what it allows for is that it's able to withstand the upstream pressure of the river because it's a v-shaped pointing upstream empty right now and in a minute i'm going to ask him to fill it for you guys so you can see it fill and what what you couldn't do right now is open the upstream miter gates not even if you wanted to because you don't have equal pressure um, on both sides of that gate meaning being empty right now you've got all the pressure of the river upstream on that gate right now and you just couldn't open it But if you fill the chamber and you have equal water pressure behind the gate and in front of the gate, then with pretty much ease, with with some hydraulic help, I suppose, you can open that gate um, when you've got equal pressure. So right now we could open and close the downstream gates, no problem. But when we fill this chamber up, we could not because you'd have the pressure of the water on it again. So then you'd drain the chamber until you needed to open it again. That's right. And this whole thing is gravity fed. And so when we want to fill the chamber, we just open up some pumps on the upstream side and use the river to fill the chamber itself. And then when we want to release it, we do the same thing. We let gravity take it downstream as well. I'll send you the turtle book. It's a very simple way for someone in a fishing boat to pull right on up, pick up the red phone down there at the bottom, call the lock operator, and then move their personal craft in and then lock through. What they always need to keep in mind though is that commercial vessels take priority. Okay. And so if a, if a commercial vessel's in, in route, then that um, private vessel's gonna have to wait. And sometimes that can be two to four to five hours depending on how much okay. that barge is towing. Now it's uh, 9.52 and you've got gravity pulling water from the upstream. What comes in from the sides? Feeling, right. Yeah, there are uh, aqueducts or channels underneath the left and the right side and it's pulling that water in. Done with the whale. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are valves. Okay. But, you know, if you had a, a ball valve, yeah. it's basically okay. like that. Okay. Much more complicated though. But the water's coming from the bottom of the channel? That's or right. The side? The bottom? bottom well, it's coming from the sides, yeah. but down there is a concrete bottom mm -hmm. that's got grooves in it that's allowing that water to move in and come in through there. Wow. And it's filling up pretty quick. What did I say? 9.52. So I asked Jay, what is the most unique vessel you've ever seen locked through? I expected him to say a guy on a jet ski or a group of kayakers. What he actually said took me by surprise. How about a submarine? Whoa. No. So the USS Razorback okay, in, Little Rock. in Little Rock was brought up with assistance from barges um, to be parked there as a maritime museum but a submarine might be the craziest. Um, we've also had uh, flagships. Yeah, that's right. The, the flagships have come through. The, uh, the Hoga, um, which is uh, a tugboat that was at Pearl Harbor, also sits next to the USS Razorback. So those are some pretty unique things. If you've ever been near the Arkansas River, anywhere between the Port of Catoosa in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the Mississippi River, you have probably seen a barge or two traveling up or down the river. Watching barges is one of our favorite activities while camping at the various U.S. Army Corps of Engineer campgrounds along the river. In fact, we recently watched a barge traveling downriver from our vacation rental at the base of Petty Jean Mountain. So what is actually shipping on those barges? Well, headed upriver, you might see steel headed for construction projects in northwest Arkansas. Coming downriver are products like petroleum, aggregate, rice, and soybeans. Arkansas is the number one rice exporter in the United States, and so those agricultural resources are shipped down the MCARNs to the Mississippi, the Gulf, and then around the world. Imagine taking the things off the interstate system that you wouldn't want on there, and you would safely transport them here. Rock or aggregate is used to make concrete. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's in certain types of rock at that, at that matter. So also we use those rocks in the river system here to channel the system. If you go across the Arkansas River and you see these rock structures pointing out into the river, mm -hmm. those are jetties, dikes, and revetments. But what they really are to us are training structures. Okay. They're helping us train this river where to go Right now, we offer commercial mariners a nine-foot navigation channel. We guarantee them nine feet from the Mississippi River to the Port of Catoosa. We guarantee them that so that they know how much they can load their barges to. Um, and by, we're able to do that with what's called a self-training river or self-scouring river. We put those jetties, dikes, and revetments that you see way out there. They are, they are basically V-shaped and they point towards the navigation channel and what that does is the water gets forced into the navigation channel, creating velocity, and it self-scours it out. Okay, the bottom sediment. Huh? That's right. It, it scours that bottom sediment out, um, ensuring a nine-foot navigation depth. And our engineers are smart enough, they'll put those rock structures in place, and then they wait for the river to respond. We run some sonar, we see we're at nine feet, we're good. If we're not at nine feet, we can adjust those structures. So that's how the system was built all the way across. To eliminate as much need for dredging and stuff. Right, dredging is very expensive and you got to figure out where you're going to put that dredge material as well. So self-scouring is a better option. So these are big hydraulic presses. We might be able to see the other side better, um, but it's a big arm. And then we'll walk around here in a second and I'll show you guys a sector gear. So basically this big arm is being pushed by a hydraulic and then it's moving a gear which is allowing this miter gate to open and close. Right. And it's a bit chilly today, so you can use the handrails, but on a hot day, you don't necessarily want to. Uh, you'll, get a, you'll get a bee sting. You'll be running your hand along here and catch a, a hornet or something, but you can see right back there, Lindsay, is that sector gear I was talking about. That hydraulic moves up and down, allowing that gear to retract and open these gates. And it takes big equipment to operate big infrastructure like oh, this. It's so much wider from here than it does standing on the side. You know, you realize how big the lock is across. 110 feet wide. Wow. 
And so what I was talking about is the types of goods and commodities. These are the things that you don't want on our interstate system. So if you're on Interstate 40, it's already busy enough. There's already a bunch of 18-wheelers um, on our interstate systems. One 15-barge tow fully loaded is equivalent to 780 18-wheelers taken off of our interstate systems. Wow. I don't know about you, but that number is absolutely astonishing to me. And most of that stuff is that petroleum, that aggregate, and that stuff that we don't want on our interstate systems in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so you can see here the water is much higher here than it is down here. Mm -hmm. So we don't have equal pressure downstream. Mm -hmm. We couldn't open this gate if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. I've always looked at these and imagined that it's not totally watertight. I'm sure it leaks, but it's so minimal compared to what you can put in, it's irrelevant. It's just holding right. majority of it, right? The, the seeping is normal, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what you also get with a river system like this is, uh, is hydropower. And on the river system, you're gonna have multiple hydropower plants. That one's actually um, not a Corps of Engineers plant, but we have one at Ozark and we have one at Russellville that generate hydropower as well as provide navigation for our nation. Um, our hydropower plants are what's called peaking plants. So when it's really cold outside or really hot outside, the power grid takes a hit. It needs extra energy. And so they call up the Corps of Engineers and say, can you bring some power online so that we don't have blackouts or rolling black brownouts? So when we had that cold snap earlier this year, or the polar vortex in 2021, or the hottest days in the summertime, that's when you'll see our units coming online. So we're providing the nation with navigation, hydropower, recreation, and environmental stewardship with this river system through our state. So you get a lot of benefits, the, the recreation benefits alone, the fishing, the camping, just the sightseeing. Each one of these locks is accompanied by a dam, and the dams, what they do is trap the pools that allow um, us to be able to keep that nine foot navigation depth that we have for the mariners. So there's a huge um, drop from the Port of Catoosa in Oklahoma to the, to the Mississippi River. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's zero feet mean sea level at the Mississippi, and I think it's like a 500 foot drop. And what you have with that, under normal circumstances without locks and dams, is on a dry, hot summer day, this river would dry up and you'd be able to walk across it in a lot of places. So before these locks and dams and navigation structures were in place, this river system would dry up in multiple places. Um, the deepest pools would stay, um, but it would only fill up most of the time during floods and the rainy seasons. So you've got miter gates in the lock and dam structure itself, and then tainer gates on the dam itself. And when we want water to come from upriver to downriver, we raise those gates up. We don't actually let water go over the top of them. So those gates are sealed on the bottom, and when we want water to come through them, we open them. If there's enough debris behind one of those gates, we can open it. Uh -huh. um, what we have above the lock and dam structure, though, I'm sorry, the lock structure over here, though, is we'll get debris there, and if a boat's trying to come through, we don't want to open that up with all the debris. Right. So we've got what's called trash racks and bubblers, okay. and we, we use gravity as well, so out in front of there is these bubblers, we can pull oxygen through and it pushes that debris away, um, allowing safe passage for those vessels. Okay. But, but there's also trash racks uh -huh. up on, on here as well. We can open it up and um, the trash racks catch the big stuff, but the small stuff moves through and then every now and then every few years we'll clean those trash racks. 2019 flood, um, you know, is the, the largest flood we've ever had in this river system and we saw refrigerators, no. deep freezes, anything that the water could collect and, and bring it down the river. What we don't do is control this river for flood control. This is only for navigation in the state of Arkansas. There are some flood control dams in Oklahoma that help us out, but when we get that much volume of water coming through here, we lift the gates straight out um, yeah. and the water just goes. This area right here that we're standing was underwater in 2019. That bridge outside the back of the, the lock house over there did not exist in 2019. Um, but what we try to do is seal up these facilities like submarines so that we can maintain them during a flood. Uh, but we, we realized we lost power. Water got so high, our generators weren't functioning. We lost power, we couldn't man it, we had to abandon it. Um, so we built these bridges and we've got our generators and our water and different stuff up there so that we can man these things in a flood event just like 2019. It's important for folks to understand that they kept asking us during the 2019 flood, well why don't you just let more water go or hold more water back? 
These dams are not designed like that. Greer's Ferry is designed to hold water for long amounts of times, but these dams on the Arkansas River are not. The difference being is we're not tied in between a valley right here. Right. So at Greer's, you know, you've got mountain on both sides. Here you don't. We're just in a flat river area. Picture this. I, I've been trying to convince folks for years to paint these tanks right here like this, like minions. No. Like how hilarious. That's a minion, right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, that would be awesome. What's the one minion with the one eye? What's his name? I don't I know. But... His name. It's all in jest. I'm joking, <laughs> but that just looks like a minion to me. And we got them at each one of our structures. Out there, I guess. Yep. But it just beautiful place out here. I mean, yeah. this is one of our more scenic ones. Just gorgeous. With the mountain in the back. Yeah. So the main transportation is New Orleans to Oklahoma, right? That's where all the traffic pretty much is coming up here, going to and from. Yeah. So the, the furthest inland spot is Tulsa, mm -hmm. but you've got five ports that, that have capabilities to ship things around the world. So the first one's Pine Bluff, oh. then you've got uh, Little Rock, and you've got, uh, mm, I'm gonna get it wrong, Russellville, Fort Smith, Port of Catusa. Okay. We know that our goods and commodities get shipped around the world um, because our mariners tell us where things are going, first of all, um, and we know where our customers are. But a few years ago, a, a grain farmer in Oklahoma was, uh, was, was doing some stuff and he had his phone in his pocket right here and he leaned over a grain bin that was getting put onto the river and his phone fell into this grain bin. And you just don't jump into these grain bins or bins full of corn, there's typically oxygen pockets you can get pulled in and sucked in. So he had to let his phone go. So his phone gets put on this barge that gets shipped from the Port of Catoosa in Oklahoma, through Oklahoma, through Arkansas, down the Mississippi, out the Gulf and then around the world over to Japan. Well, months later, a farmer in Japan is using this grain and he finds a cell phone and he drives it off and charges it up and calls the guy and says, Konnichiwa, I have your phone. <laughs> so not only do we know the grain made it, we know that his phone made it as well. And so we know that our goods and commodities that get pulled down to the MCARNs, McClellan Kerr Arkansas River Navigation System, are shipped around the world. So we're not only supplying our Kansans, we're supplying globally um, folks with our goods and commodities. Wow. Very cool. Wow, we are up there. Yeah. This will give you a better idea of the size of the structure that you're on. It's hard to appreciate it when you're not up here. Yeah. But you can look down and see. It was completely underwater in 2019. We had to go back through and rebuild almost everything. There was so much sand and silt that in those canopies at the picnic tables there, they were filled full of dirt. Oh, wow. And in that dirt was snakes and worms. Oh, <laughs> they used to, after the flood, you had to rebuild stuff? That was yeah, that's right. There was so much debris with that flood, it was just pummeling everything. Yeah. But pretty much with this structure, obviously some maintenance afterward, but it's made to withstand it. You just have to do some maintenance afterward, but that's nothing right. really damaged. Just check your lines. Yeah. And then you want to make sure you come out here and you manually exercise the gates. Mm -hmm. um, you, want to, you, want to, you want to listen, yeah. you want to feel. Yeah. So if you start to move it and all of a sudden, uh -huh. woo, bang, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And what you have that you can't see just downstream of here is giant concrete blocks underneath the water called baffle blocks. So when we raise these gates, they can let a lot of water go. And that means they could just scour everything out. But we put these baffle blocks there to reduce the turbidity. Okay, because we've noticed at like Toad Suck, the way the water seems to go backwards on the other side. Is that what that is? Yeah, is there yeah. The shape of concrete. We're breaking. That? We're breaking it up. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to slow down. So what's it shaped like under there? Is it curved? Nah, it's just big concrete. It's a oh, it's, it's a it's it's okay. a big concrete block with like a ramp on the front okay. of it. So it does shoot it up. Okay. Cause I always see it going back toward the toward the dam. Right. Right. And that's just to slow it down. We were there 
just in time for the spawning of the alligator. Was alligator gar? Yeah. And there was thousands of them all over. It was amazing, right at the bottom of the dam. And so what fishermen tried to understand is when gates will open and close, because when water rises and falls, that's when fish go into feeding frenzies. Okay. And so at places like Toad Suck or even here or below the Big Dam Bridge, they always want to know what gates we're going to be operating. But what our engineers have discovered over years is you can't just, let's just say that's everybody's favorite fishing pier all the way down there. Right. You can't just open that one gate down there constantly because then you've just got one spot that's kind of scoured itself and is clear. You've got to operate them. The engineers have come up with a schedule to operate them independently so that we're clearing the system out um, yes. instead of just one small spot. So when you're not releasing water, which, where does it come out? Obviously it keeps flowing, so does it come out so we're just, we, just, we just stopped the river for right now. Oh, okay, so yeah. there's nothing going from here to here. No, none of these, we'll, when we walk back down there, you can look, none of these gates are open uh -huh. that I could I see today. I didn't know if there was a place on the edge where it still kind of flows or it's totally stopped. No, we've, we've got it totally stopped. Okay. We're, we're just holding it right now. All that rainfall that came last week has passed through. Mm -hmm. What we do is when we get a heavy rainfall like that, the river will uh, rise above 70,000 cubic feet per second and we'll issue what's called a small craft advisory, letting okay. small, small vessels know that it's unsafe to be on the river. Okay. We won't lock them through um, above 70,000 cubic feet per second. We will lock the commercial mariners through, mm -hmm. but typically when you get to 100, 150,000 cubic feet per second, it's counterproductive okay. to try to push upstream, upstream that much weight and then when you're going downstream with a vessel like that with several million dollars worth of goods and commodities, you've actually got to be going faster than the water to maintain steerage. Okay. And when you've got that much value, yeah. you don't want to be going that well, fast. They adjust their schedule based on that. Okay. Yeah. They just won't even come up. When the flows are, are that just that high, they won't, they won't go unless they've got to get something somewhere. We don't allow small vessels um, to get any closer than those restricted signs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they do want to get closer because they want to fish next yeah. to the dam, but if we had to make an emergency gate operation, um, it would be, be very challenging for them to get out of there fast enough. <laughs> and sometimes they'll hit our structures, um, which of course we don't want. It, it, at Russellville, for instance, we found those big hooks up on our structure, you know, yeah. hooked oh, really? to these. Oh, that could be dangerous. For yeah. Personnel. For our personnel, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very serious issue, and so we've had to push the fishing at Russellville back a little bit yeah. further. At the Big Dam Bridge, um, we have found some of the craziest things dropped off the bridge onto our structures. And if you ever go there again, you'll see a gated structure yeah, across the top of the lock structure. Yeah, you can't throw rocks or so that you can't throw yeah. big items off the top of that down onto those barges or the people working. How about we go under the river? <laughs> yes. It really predates, you know, um, electronically operating. So you got people that need to come up here and make gate changes. They come up here, hop on the buggy drive down, make the gate changes, and then go right back in. Just a gauge where we can see how high the water's getting. Okay. Kind of standing right here gives you an idea of the size of the structure too. Oh, yeah, it really does. Right now it's closed, but if it was open, it would go under open. Yep. Gotcha. And right now, flows are around 10,000 cubic feet per second, and that's basically standing still for this river system. Okay. You say Little Rock in all the app stores is what, where you can find it. And what you get is real-time data, not so much a future forecast from us, because right. we only calculate actual data on the ground. We don't make decisions to release water or adjust our structures based off forecast because they're just not accurate enough. Right. So we wait until waters hit the ground and we know what the, the conditions are and then we adjust our structures. Okay. You will have Southwestern Power. They're the ones that, that, that take our energy. They will put out forecasts. Um, they'll say, hey, we think we're gonna need energy at five o'clock in the evening because everyone's um, turning their stoves on and charging their devices and so folks can expect that we'll that generation would happen then mm -hmm. yeah so he'll operate that gate and what you'll get to see is that sector gear working there and then if we wanted to look at this hydraulic piston over here too we could see it as well
Ja. Remember I said we had the trash bubblers? And we don't want them kinking up our structure right through here. So if you had a large log right there, it wouldn't be able to open all the way. That's right. And now a barge could enter or leave. What's the drop right now between the upper and lower? Do you know roughly? I don't know what their drop is here, but it's not as high as some of the others. In Russellville, we've got about a 50 foot drop. Okay. Um, here, it may be 15 feet. Okay. We can ask the guy inside if he knows. What to do is called a double cut, which means you're going to have to bring your first load in, okay. moor it onto that, that red thing right there. That's called tow haulage. You're going to okay. attach it to that. Okay. And then, <laughs> got me. And then uh, they'll untie, they'll, they'll have a deck hand, tend that line, okay. but then he'll back up with the rest of his load, close okay. the gates, that, that tow haulage takes the load down to the end down there. Um, it actually slingshots it. So, okay. and when I say slingshot, it's moving very, very slow. <laughs> but it's, it's being guided by the walls. It pushes that load. So when the downstream gate opens, the tow haulage shoots it out through there. And then the, the deck hands on the other side will lasso those moors okay. to the wall, right? And catch it and wait for the rest of the vessel to come through. That makes sense why it takes so long to have to do it in pieces. Okay. And you're, you're, what you're moving is just so expensive, yeah. and so you want it to go slow and you want to be careful. Um, we have a lot of safety protocols in place to avoid major catastrophic accidents. We make them slow down, so each there's what's called a red book, and every mariner has one, and it tells them their, their precise um, knots that they're supposed to be traveling when they approach these locks, and if we've got heavy drafts, we'll even make them stop before they even touch our walls. Um, and you know those boat captains are very good at that and very good at complying. And then we can even ask them what they're hauling if we don't want it through our lock chamber because of some reason, we can turn them away. Now we have such a great relationship with the commercial mariners that we don't have to do that, but, but we could, you know, if, if something were to happen. But a lot of safety protocols in place to protect this infrastructure to keep it moving for our country. Oh yeah, because someone hits a wall and messes it up, that would be a lot of downtime. If a, if a vessel hit one of these miter gates, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. And it's happened, mm -hmm. they've bumped them, and then you got to get our engineers out here. What typically happens is if you bump them, um, they're, they're sitting in hinges like your door at home. Mm -hmm. And so you can make adjustments just like you would at home too. And so you bring the engineers out here and they adjust the hinges. Okay. And typically you can do that by exercising them. They're so heavy, they'll just fall back into place. Okay. Um, but we want our engineers making those decisions. It's still safe. That's right. This, this is, a, is where they tie on, right? No, this is a life preserver. Oh, <laughs> should, should somebody. It's that red thing. So those are floating moors. Okay. And so basically they'd come in with the water high right here. You connect to that moor as the water drops, so does that moor. So it okay, goes, it's so just, it's just a... This red thing is yeah. the tie off. No, oh, that right there, yeah, that's called tow haulage. Tow haulage. That's how it, I was like looking at this over. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, that tow haulage, it's on a, it's on a, like a, um, a railroad tie. Got it. Going back and forth right there, and it hooks up to the barge and pulls it backwards and forwards. Okay, now I get it. See, so he's closing that gate now. Sorry, am I missing anything? Um, so far, I think this is the best damn tour. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you missed anything thus far. I think it's very educational uh, for those who don't know, not aware. We're very proud of what it does. I mean, there's already, if you drove from here to Fort Smith, I mean, and it needs to be this way, but if you drove from here to Fort Smith, it's a lot of 18 wheelers. Same thing from here to Memphis. Oh, yeah. um, but that's, 
that's the stuff that's on our shelves. It needs to be transported, it needs to be moving. It can be frustrating, but it needs to be moving. And so if we could take some of that traffic and put it on this river system, um, we're proud to be able to do that. Oh yeah, we're in favor of that. They fabricate equipment, um, they operate the lock itself, and it's also a place where we can go down into the galley and get underneath the river. And so I'll take you guys down there. Okay. It's very dark, but we'll turn the lights on. The lock house, right? Yeah, this is the lock house for Arthur V. Ormond Lock and Dam. Winthrop Rockefeller Lake, which backs up that way. Each one of these locks and dams creates a reservoir, okay. basically. And most of them have been named after somebody. Got it. All right, and we'll come down here. Yep. This is what it feels like. And we basically have these galleys to be able to inspect our structures. I can film this, right? Yes. Yes, you can. Some original placards from when the reservoir and lock and dams were built. So this is number nine. Um, but some fun facts about how they were numbered on the Arkansas River is uh, there was originally designed to be a, no a number 11, but it was never built. So if you look at uh, the system, um, you'll, be, you'll see it go, you know, 9, 10, 12. And you're like, wait a minute, where's number 11? It was never built, so they never put it in there. Um, and then we later had to go back in and install Montgomery Point Lock and Dam, and it would in turn be number one, but there was already a lock number one, so now it's 99. So it goes 99, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, um, and that's just, uh, how it happened throughout history. Now we've got these galleys that, uh, that just seem to go on forever and ever. This one goes all the way along the lock chamber wall right here. It goes all the way down and it's just so that, that we can inspect for normal seepage and leakage. Um, so we are below water level. You are below water right now. And of course we keep our yard tools underwater. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you. If these, if these flood, we use this equipment to come in down here and clean it out because yeah. silt and sediment can rest in here as well. And I'm, I'm being very generous. I'm getting every cobweb first. Oh, thank you. So have you guys uh, gone to uh, Blanchard Springs Caverns or any of those? Yes. So you know stalactites and stalagmites yes. form there. I don't think we'll see any here, but in many of our structures that are 50, 60 years old, um, the calcium deposits have started to form stalactites. Wow. And I like showing people this too, because there's a lot of folks that say, well, hey, what's down there? What are you hiding? Right. We're not really hiding anything. Oh, uh, yeah, look at, the there's some concrete, um, and movies come out and, you know, these dams are hiding aliens or whatever it may be. That's not the case. Yeah, we'd be going towards Pettyjean now. Right. And we'll take a turn and start going underneath the dam. And we need to be able to inspect our structures so we could make it to the top if we went that way. And then we won't go any further, but you can go down even further into the galleys and then all the way across the dam. You could go all the way across the river by going down through here. Wow. So we are now in line with the, the dam. gates. The gates are the dam. Uh, yeah. yeah. But you're, oh, you're another 30 feet down there. At least, yeah. So workers can essentially walk under under those gates, what was the team word you said again? Tanner gates. Yeah, they, they can walk under those all the way across. That's wow. right. I did not know that was under there. You can send buckets full of tools down, you know. <laughs> Sim simple pulley. Oh yeah. And then if we follow Mr. Tom, we'll start making our way out. And then I'll leave you with this thought then. Um, you know, the, the people that design and built these things are Arkansans. The people that work them, are just good Arkansans, right? We're your t-ball coaches and your Sunday school teachers. We're just like everybody else. And so when folks want to get mad at the Corps of Engineers, I mean, just, just know we have a purpose. We have a reason. And, and we feel proud to do it because we're Arkansans and we understand it. And it's unfortunate that you know, we, we've kind of gone through a period of time since 9-11 where we couldn't just open the doors and let everybody in and right. fully understand. Um, but 
It is more important to protect our assets. We went right, down this right way, way we under, the, yeah, we went all the way up there under the gates and we were just to the point where the ladder drops down and goes so underneath the this, dam. Close to the minion, right? Yeah, that's, that's, where we that's right. Wow. Designed as fallout shelters and were stocked as such at one time, but they are not anymore. Okay. When they were built and designed, they were built and designed to be fallout structures for the types of things during that yeah. time. Mm -hmm. But now we've got much bigger and much more dangerous things <laughs> on our <laughs> planet. Yeah, and so good. these are not stocked as fallout shelters anymore. And okay. you haven't taken the sign down because you have to get the official verification first. Uh, <laughs> I think it's nostalgic. Yeah. And so it's just yeah. kind of left there for that. Cool. Even the federal building we work in downtown in the bathrooms has fallout shelter. But I've been all over that place. I do not want to be there if a disaster <laughs> happens. Like, Besides the locks and dams and the campgrounds that we're all used to here in Arkansas, have you ever wondered what else the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers does? Solution to this hospital shortage. And so we came up with alternative care facilities that could be made out of hotels and just empty spaces where you could turn these into hospitals very quickly. Zero pressure locations that could host COVID patients. Um, when the key bridge was hit, they called the Corps of Engineers and said, hey, we know this isn't your thing, but we need help with this bridge removal. The navigation channels are, so we've already got a temporary channel open, moving priority shipping through there. Okay. When something happens, when 9-11 happens, they call the Corps of Engineers. Okay. When a hurricane hits, they call the Corps of Engineers. So we have a very broad mission all around the world, globally. I want to say thank you to Jay, Lieutenant Colonel Warren, and everyone at the Lock and Dam today for giving us this tour. We appreciate your kindness toward us today and for all of the work that you do here in Arkansas and around the world every day. If you liked this video, please remember to hit the thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope to see you around the natural state. Additional camera provided by the squirrel. Hey girl.